Let's look at Sunday, the final day of week 21. Preview the games. Who do we stream in? And Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and Americans, we need to have a bit of a chat about how you pronounce the name Graham. Also the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com. You can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball, on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. Go ahead, double bang, thumb it up. Leave your comments. And of course, let's hit the old subscribe button. We are here because we're talking Sunday. The final day in week 21, the final day in many of your matchups, the final day of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowls, the Battle Royale for points and categories. Who's going to take it out? I don't think I am, but I think I'm ninth in the points one out of 60. So we'll see. Need to get that top three finish. And then we'll see how the category one plays out. And it's also the final of industry pickup, which I've got uh, knocked out of, of course, last week by Mitch Casey as he takes on Rhett Bauer in the final of that this week. Um, All right. Let's talk games. There are six of them on. We do have early starts. The first game is a 3 p.m. Eastern game. Then we've got a 3.30 p.m. Eastern game. Then a 6 p.m. Eastern game. Then two sevens. And then one that I hate when it looks at that time. What time is that in regular people time? 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, All right. Let's take a look. There are some wild starting lineups dropping on Saturday here at the moment that I'm looking at. Yeah. All right. First game that we're talking about for Sunday. One of the early ones, of course, it is the New Orleans Pelicans and the Detroit Pistons. We're in a situation here where there are no back-to-backs across Saturday and Sunday, so we don't have to worry about what happened on Saturday to see what's going to go on Sunday, which is, I guess, a good thing. The Pelicans, we know, have the good schedule. They, Everyone that I'm talking about today obviously plays on Sunday. This is a Sunday preview, so I'm not putting it on the schedule at the top of the screen that you're watching. Everyone plays Sunday. We're looking at week 22 now. The Pelicans have the best schedule Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, all low-volume days. Only three games but it's all low volume. The Pistons have a stinker. Not only do they only have three games, but they're on high volume days. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Brandon Ingram is going to be out. Dyson Daniels is going to be out. Simone Fontecchio, Quentin Grimes, and Taj Gibson is going to be out. No idea when Fontecchio is coming back. I guess he could return on Monday, but at this point, you've got to be really cautious. Like, How long do you hold on for a mid-player like Fontecchio? Probably not that long. I don't think Grimes is coming back anytime soon. The big one's going to be Jalen Duran, who was a late scratch last time out for Detroit. I would expect, given his back spasms, that he does sit on Saturday, and then maybe he plays on Monday, possibly. I would put it more on the... He's officially questionable, Duran. I'd put the passport legend more on the doubtful side of questionable, though. So what are we watching? Last game for the Pelicans, Jose Alvarado went crazy. Played a million minutes, put up great stats. Now, was part of that because it was against Miami and he got into a fight against the Heat last time out and he wanted to prove himself and Willie Green actually said, hey, you've got to go out there and show these blokes here. So maybe it's part of that. Or it's because Ingram's out, so they're going to use a little bit more of Jose and push CJ McCullum more to the two. That's possible as well. So we need to watch it because if Jose is getting 30 a night, well, he's one of the biggest winners you could have with the Sunday then the three qualities next week. That's fantastic. For the Pistons, I cannot believe that I'm saying this, but we do have to watch Tosan. F11, because he's going to start. He's going to play 30 minutes because the replacement for Asar Thompson, Isaiah Stewart, was Simone Fontecchio, then it was Stanley Amude. But they're all out. All four of them are out. So Tosan's going to start. What a time. Um, Najee Marshall's getting the boost there in New Orleans as well. We know that Trey Murphy's getting the boost, but so is Jose. And so is Najee. We get 25, 26 out of Najee Marshall. And then there's a big opportunity here for Blunty, for Jim Wiseman, because if Duran is out, Wiseman is... We saw it last game. We've been talking about Wiseman unbelievably on this show. I've been talking about him for about three weeks, saying, hey, something's happening here. We're starting to push up. We're starting to get something going. We're starting to get a little bit of stream value. And if Duran's back is actually that debilitating, well, Wiseman is going to be a 12-team league guy. And honestly, if Duran didn't play at all next week, I think you would start Wiseman Monday, Wednesday, Friday. 
I think he'd move into startable player. I'm, I, can't, I can't believe I'm saying it. I think he'd be a startable player Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So there you go. It's James Wiseman uh, time. The second game is the Philadelphia 76ers and the LA Clippers. I, I'd say the struggling Sixers, but that's like an understatement. They, they stink. And they have a terrible schedule next week as well. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. In fact, it's exactly the same as the Clippers who don't play a single quality game all of next week. Embiid is out. Melton is out. Covington is out. Westbrook is out, but could be returning on Monday for the six uh, for the Clippers. Do not add him. No, 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 no. Um, PJ Tucker uh, left the last game with an injury. And Norman Powell, who they just keep listing questionable. Like my guy, the bloke's leg was rooted. He was no chance of playing any of those games this week. But now we're in a situation where I'm not really sure if Powell's going to play. I'd probably put him on the doubtful side again, considering it's a back-to-back here for Normie. But they're not giving us anything with that. What we need to watch for Philadelphia is Paul Reed, Because last game, he played 13 minutes. And Bumba played 31. It is very important in fantasy basketball to pay attention to the last game. That is important. But it's not the most important thing. Because we can all look at this and go, man, Mo Bumba, he looks awesome. Man. He's got to be a must-grab. But the game before, he played 19 minutes and Reed played 27. And the game before that, Bumba played 19 minutes and Reed played 26 or whatever it was. So it was one game and it was impactful and it was meaningful. But I don't think there's any guarantee that that means that Bumba is now a 30-minute guy all the way through because literally nothing changed in that game. It wasn't like someone got hurt, so that means we have to go to more Bumba. And B's been out for two months. And Bumba has never done that in any game at all. So does Bumba make sense against the Clippers team switching on to Kawhi, Paul George, Jim Harden? I don't think so. But I, I just don't know. So while it was very disappointing from Paul Reed, and given the schedule here and the uncertainty on minutes, like that is hard to consider him for next week as a must roster guy. I'm not saying that Bumba's getting 30 a night. The chance is there, but I don't know that's going to happen. Terrence Mann was also a really good last game for the Clippers. It did take Powell being out and Tucker going out and him also just having a game out of nowhere. I'm not super interested, but there's only six games on Sunday, so at least he moves into the discussion there for us. Cali Uber is just doing stuff that he hasn't done literally all season. He's blocking shots. He's scoring big. He's playing gigantic minutes. I don't really get I don't really get coaches' infatuation with Ubre. I, I don't understand it, especially when I see coaches like Nick Nurse and Steve Clifford, who I just think would hate the way that Ubre plays, and then they give him big minutes, and he plays still the way that Ubre plays, and it doesn't really ever lead to winning, yet he still gets the minutes. I, I don't really understand it, but it is happening at the moment, so we're leaning into it. He's getting a ton of playing time, Kelly, and it's translating into good numbers at the moment. The other guy to watch for is Amir Coffey with the expectation that I have of no Westbrook and maybe no Powell and maybe no Tucker. Amir gets a little bit of a boost there. It's not gigantic. The other thing with the watch is they're keeping Kawhi's minutes low. I think his wrist might be a bit sore, but like Harden and George get 35, 36. Kawhi's getting 31, 32. So watch that as well. So that gives Amir Coffey a, uh, a slight boost in that scenario. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It is that time of the year to get your buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That is $150 if your bet wins. You can bet all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Go in there with uh, the individual game props. You can look at the um, future awards for players and for teams to win the championship. The, all the money lines and the spreads and the totals, they're all available as per usual. And we do that across the uh, NCAA tournament as well. So go to fanjul.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. Fanjul is an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. And don't forget to gamble responsibly. Okay. That's two games down. We've got four to go. We've got a Cleveland and Miami next teams that are absolutely beat up at the moment. Cleveland do have four games the next week, all on the bad days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. Miami only three games, but they do play Tuesday. So there's a bonus there, but then they don't go again until Friday, Sunday on the high volume days. Don Mitchell is out. Max Struess is out. Dean Wade is out. But the Koala, Evan Mobley, has been upgraded to questionable. Now, you would think... Coming back off that ankle sprain, he's no real chance to play in both Sunday and Monday's games. But the fact that he's been upgraded is a really good sign, clearly. And he would be startable when he plays. Uh, on the Miami side, no hero, no love, no Robinson. And the two guys that saw their minutes cut dramatically last game were Jaime Jaquez and Caleb Martin. Now, I thought it was mainly because they sucked, because they did. They were really quite bad in that game. But now they've popped up both with the, the weird designation, which might be one of the more low-key annoying teams in terms of injury designations. Um, like Huckers and Caleb Martin on there with knee and ankle soreness. Both of them, huh? Is that why you sat them? Are you protecting their pride or because they sucked? 
That is a weird injury, injury designation. It doesn't make any sense. And I have no doubt that they're playing. But I'm telling you that they're on there because they are, for whatever reason. We'll see what happens to George Nyang. Because he's been playing really well for the Cavs. But with Mobley back, does Nyang still get that role? There's still no Dean Wade. Look, where does... does well, he can't play 30 minutes a night with Mobley back, but do they just marginalize him to 18 or 19? Where does Nyang's value now sit? And then for Miami, I think we've, we do have to go back to watching Caleb Barton, who who was terrible last game, and that meant they had to insert Hayward Highsmith into the uh, rotation. But Highsmith doesn't necessarily play every game. So does Martin get back to 30? Uh, we need to watch it, don't we? Because he's at least somewhat streamable, especially for that upcoming Tuesday game. Isaac Okoro continues to get the boost with no Struess and no Mitchell. He doesn't do anything with that boost, and you 100% don't use him through the four games of next week. But for Sunday, he's always got the occasional 1-in-20 game where he can pop off and have a really strong one. Overall, he's been pretty disappointing. The other one to watch is, again, this is more deeper leagues, but Pat Mills is starting with Duncan Robinson out. Now, we, he, he's, we love him. He's, he's passed it, obviously. And you know, if I'm going to be fair and I'm going to do this, I've got to do this to Patty. But the fact that he is starting... And if there's a couple of shots go in, he might get 25 minutes. He might get 12 points with three threes. It's enough for deeper leagues to watch because normally he'd get zero minutes. But there is a chance for just a little bit when you get desperation times to try and find someone to get some scoring. Well, Millsy's going to get a chance. Maybe. The Thunder. The Milwaukee Bucks. Um, pretty good matchup here. The Thunder have a solid enough schedule starting next week with a Tuesday game. And then they go Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. So fringe thunderies, you can drop them after that. While the Bucks rival the Pelicans having the best schedule. They obviously play Sunday, as everyone does, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, all low-volume days. And at the moment, unbelievably, both these teams have got clean injury reports. Giannis and Middleton both appear as probable. We know what probable means. It means you're going to get out there 95% of the time. For the Thunder, Chet Holmgren, the last time we saw him was amazing. I want to see, and I've written both Chet and Brook Lopez as the things I want to watch here, what's on my radar. How does Chet go against a player like Brook Lopez, who has been pushing back a bit and Rivers has been reducing his minutes? But that's been some of the concern, I guess, with Chet. Like the big, strong guys like Lopez, where does he sort of, how does he fit? How does, does he make Lopez pay? Does Lopez nullify him? We want to see that, I guess. In terms of guys getting boosted, they continue to give Josh Giddy this outsized role in lower minutes. And that's giving him fantasy value, which he didn't have for the first two months of the season. While for Milwaukee, we do see um, uh, Glenn Rivers give a little bit more to Bob Portis. Now, Portis's value really spikes when Giannis is out, but he is just doing a little bit more under Glenn than he was under uh, Adrian to start the season. The Golden State Warriors, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Pretty interesting stuff in this one, I think. Really good game. The Warriors obviously need to get better. I'm not sure they're going to. They play on Tuesday, the Warriors, so that's really good scheduling there. And then Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, we don't care for. While the Wolves have a terrible schedule. Not only do they not play Monday, Tuesday, but then every one of their games is on the high volume Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. So your fringe Wolves, Kyle Anderson, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Mike Conley, yes, Nas Reed, maybe, probably not, but maybe their value is really diminished. And the Wolves are also turning into one of the more annoying injury reporting teams. Anthony Edwards is on the injury report every single game as questionable now. He's LeBron and Anthony Davis in it. And now Rudy Gobert, who after playing 37 minutes last game, has popped back on the injury report here. I don't think there's any risk of Gobert or Edwards sitting, but they're there, so I've got to tell you about it. But they are turning into an annoying injury reporting team. They were pretty annoying last season with Towns. Remember when the injury, when they said, ah, it's, yeah, look, yeah, he'll be back in like a week. And Towns like, came out like a month later, bro, it's a three-month injury. Why are you telling them I'm back so soon? They're a low-key bad injury reporting team. Pajemski was great last time for the Warriors. It's his first good game in about three or four weeks. I'm not going to super overreact to it, but Sunday, Tuesday, quality game combo means he's at least somewhat back on the streaming menu. And then for the Wolves, Nas Reed had some uh, struggles in the first half with foul trouble. He didn't start the second half, but ended up playing those 26, 27 minutes. I still maintain that Reed is, is putting up good numbers, but the real unlocking of Reed is when he plays 33 and he doesn't get that all the time. We'll see. Do they go back to starting him at power forward or does he go and play the backup center, backup power forward role again, because most of the games, he's come off the bench. The last one, he did start, and they reverted course in the second half. Guys getting boosted, while well, we are getting big boosts from Chase Jackson Davis basically every game, and it's really impossible, I think, with that schedule to not roster him. And then Kyle Anderson continues to get the boost. He continues to have 10, 5, 5, 1 steal, 0.8 blocks. Like, this is what he does, time in, time out. The minutes are strong enough. You've got a little bit there now. When we get to the schedule for them next week, he's not going to be good enough to hold through those three, but we're getting Kyle Anderson pretty regularly. The last game is the Indiana Pacers. They're taking on the Los Angeles Lakers. It's the final game of the day. The uh, Pacers don't have a weekend game in week 22. They go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, bad schedule. 
The Lakers do play Tuesday, so that's a W, but then it's Wednesday, Friday, Sunday for them. Injury-wise, James Johnson is still on the Pacers roster. He's questionable. While the artist, formerly known as Torian Prince, had to miss the last game for personal reasons. They don't have a full update on that, but I'm going to put him as questionable, while Vanderbilt and Vincent still remain out for the Lakers. Aaron Neesmith was pretty poor last game. I know it's, you might think that he's had a terrible run. I think he's 101st in category leagues over the last two weeks. That's still solid enough. There are frustrations with him. It does require really good shooting to deliver any sort of value. So we want to watch that the role doesn't change. I don't think it does, but I want to pay attention to that. And then also Rui Hachimura, who hasn't hit 30 minutes in three straight games. If we don't get 30 minutes of Rui, he is not a 12-team league guy, except that they are one of the teams that go Sunday, Tuesday, which is a great combination of games. But otherwise, he's dropping down and we're seeing other guys step into that role. TJ McConnell, much like uh, much like discussing Josh Giddy earlier on, he's playing low minutes, but they're just pumping so much stuff into him. His big assist rate, big usage, steals are good. He's doing so much in the limited time he's out there. Well, Rui does continue to get boosted because Vanderbilt is out, but you know, we've seen the production drop off from him and the really only benefit now for Hachimura is the way that the schedule does uh, break down for him at the moment and the Lakers, of course. Today's episode is also brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel, not FanDuel Sportsbook, what do I talk about? Apologies to Price Picks because Price Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. It's the easiest and the most exciting way to play DFS. It is just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on two to six individual player stat projections and you watch the winnings roll in. It is demon time. On Price Picks, you can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000. The Demons and Goblins are the newest and the most exciting way to play at Price Picks. Squares marked with a red demon or a green goblin get you different payouts. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, an enormous selection of player and stat types. That's what makes Price Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. So go to pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. The code is locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. The code is locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Price Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Okay, so that's the six games done. Let's have a bit of a squiz at the schedule. We did do the Week 22 preview show earlier today. It's not a very good schedule. You're well aware of this. So let's just talk about what we've got here. Five teams have the Sunday-Monday back-to-back. There are a lot of games on Monday, so this might not be of use to you. But if it is and you've got the space, here we go. Cleveland, Detroit, Indiana, the Clippers, and the Sixers. The problem here is who's playing for the Cavs? Is Struess back? Is Wade back? Does Mobley play both? One? None? I don't know. The Pistons, Matt. Fontecchio? Duran? Cade, they could have completely different lineups in both games and stuff all over the shop. The Pacers should be pretty solid. The Clippers will probably get Westbrook back Monday, maybe even Norm Powell on that one. And the Sixers, well, we're not expecting Melton or Embiid to return anytime soon, so their lineup should be relatively stable. If you look at the next four nights, so that's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Let's look at the teams, and there are six of them who have two quality games in that period. Golden State, the Lakers, the Thunder, the Heat, the Bucks, the Pelicans. They all go Sunday, they all go Tuesday. So this is the true back-to-back that you want to target. On the other side, there are two teams that only play one game in the next four nights, and that's Boston and Orlando, right? So that's one just total game. But there are also, including Boston and Orlando, 14 teams who have zero quality games in the next four days. Four to, so that's 16 teams in total who aren't available to be streamed in in the next four days. So this is where you have to make tough decisions on the guys at the back end of your roster. Because there'd be guys that are sitting there, you say, I'm not using them. What are they doing here? Um, it's like the polar bear in Texas meme. The next five days. Who's got three quality games in the next five days? You're just going to hear this a lot. It's the Bucks and the Pelicans. There is one team, though, the Magic, who has one game, one game total in the next five games, five days. It's the Magic. So like even without like the value of Apollo and a Franz, Jalen Suggsy Suggs, you're going to use them once in the next five days. That's pretty rough. Now, they do have a quality game on Saturday at the end of week 22, but that's rough. There are also 13 other teams who have zero quality games in the next five days. Let's talk the next six days. Who plays four games in six nights? Cleveland, Detroit, Golden State, Indiana, Lakers, Clippers, Thunder, and Sixers. So that's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Four games in six nights. And then there are four teams who play two games in six nights. Boston, Memphis, Orlando, and Toronto. Always paying attention to streaming. For the next seven days, Sunday through Saturday, 
Well, there are two teams who have four quality games in that time frame. It's Milwaukee and New Orleans. There is one team who's got a two-game week. It's not Monday to Sunday, but it is a seven-day period. It's Toronto. Two games in the next seven nights. There's also 11 teams in the next seven nights with zero quality games. Search them out. Look at your roster. There are, there's going to be dead weight sitting there for a lot of you. If we look at eight days, this takes us through to the end of week 22. We have got five teams. So no, we do. Six teams who have five games in eight nights. Cleveland, Golden State, Lakers, Clippers, Thunder, Sixers. And there are six teams who have three games in eight nights. Boston, Memphis, Orlando, Phoenix, Portland, and Toronto. It's important in weekly leagues. It's important when you don't have the problem of having to make start decisions to see who's got more games. But we are still really paying attention to where we get guys in on individual days. So let's get some guys in for individual days on Sunday. Remembering, let's try and target the Sunday-Tuesday combination as much as possible. So for a Yahoo Points League, got shallow ones and deeper leagues as well. Kyle Anderson, Trace Jackson Davis, Aaron Neesmith. And then if you go deeper, Alvarado, McConnell, and Alexander Walker. Obviously, the standouts there, looking at guys like Jackson Davis, who gets the Sunday-Tuesday, but also the value of the Pelicans and the Bucks of uh, Jose Alvarado, Malik Beasley. That's just going to trump everything, basically because of how the schedule plays out for ESPN points leagues. But you know, this is also super important if your league ends this week, because we don't, you don't care about next week. You care about what happens Sunday. ESPN points is actually the same list of players. Anderson, Jackson Davis, Neesmith, Alvarado, McConnell, and Alexander Walker for category leagues for the points category. Again, we go shallow and deep. The italicized names. If you're watching on YouTube, they're the deeper league guys, less than 30% rostered. So for points, I've got Neesmith, Hachimura, and Beasley. Not a great day to stream in points. And then uh, for deeper leagues, we've got Alexander Walker, we've got Alvarado, and we've got Coro. Now, someone probably could pop off out of nowhere with random sits and rests and all that sort of stuff. It's very hard to know that in advance, though. For three-pointers, we got a Leaky Beasley. Really got that upside there to hit five of them. So is Slam and Sammy Merrill available in deeper leagues. Aaron Neesmith, the kill, Alexander Walker. Lou Dort doesn't do much else apart from shoot three, so there's something there. And then, amazingly, Troy Brown Jr. in Detroit. I don't know. I've got, well, I don't know who's going to start or what they're going to do, but he's going to play. I could even throw Evan Fournier in there. They're going to have to play because there's just a million guys out, and Brown can hit threes, and so could Fournier. So they're both sort of sitting there. For big man stuff, for rebounds, Jackson Davis is at the top there, and then Jim Wiseman. Really interested to see what they do with him. Very interested to see what they do with Paul Reed. I've got both Paul Reed and Mo Bumber on this list. Either one of them could be a complete disaster, depending on which way uh, self-branded hat legend Nick Nurse decides to go. I've got Shemezi Metu on there because the Pistons don't have other options. I'm not saying he's great, but 21, 22 minutes, six or seven boards is possible. And then Larry Nance, who's got the great Pelican schedule. He could be a 7-8 rebound guy. A little bit of value there. He's still widely available to Nance's. For blocks, a lot of the same names here. Trace Jackson Davis, Mo Bamba. Mo Bamba would very, very clearly jump to the top if we knew he was getting 30, but we don't. Paul Reed's there. James Wiseman's there. You get to a couple of perimeter guys in Jaded McDaniels and Isaac Okoro, who can bring you some blocks. And McDaniels' defensive stats have been up the last two to three games. I'm not really willing to say that it's a complete like um, change in the way his game is, but it has happened. For assists, for the guard stats, Kyle Anderson, TJ McConnell, pretty obvious ones there. Then we go down to a Marcus Sasser, a Jose Alvarado, Kyle Lowry, and Andy Nembhard. So actually, for a, a day like this, heading into the end of Week 21, Streaming assists is actually a lot easier this week than what it can be in other weeks. For steals, some similar names. Jose Alvarado, very clearly there. Larry Nance, he's a big man, doesn't block shots, but he gets steals. Kyle Anderson, TJ McConnell, Najee Marshall, and Jaden McDaniels. We notice Alvarado, Nance, and Marshall, all Pelicans, all great schedules, all good steals, guys. For field goal percentage, we're going to Jackson, Trace Jackson Davis, Jim Wiseman, Jalen Smith, who is the backup again in Indiana after that one-game absence for um, field goodness. TJ McConnell, great field goal percentage guy as a guard. you got Larry Nance and Jackson Hayes as well, who's getting those 10 to 13 minutes for the uh, Lakers. And lastly, we look at free throw percentage. And this might seem weird, but Shemezi Metu, I think he's at 83% for the season. He may or may not be that good every game, but in 23 minutes, if he goes 2 of 2 or 3 of 3 or something from the line, it's pretty useful. And he's available everywhere. All of these guys are available in so many leagues. Amir Coffey, Kyle Lowry, Ivan Fournier, Marcus Sasser, and Nikhil Alexander-Walker. And that brings us to the end of the Sunday streaming show. For Sunday, at the end of week 21, I hope that this is the end of your leagues, but I also hope that you stick around. But if it's not, we're still going. All the way through, everything is still cracking as needed. And while we're cracking, you're thumbing. Thumb it up, 
ring the bell, leave your comments and subscribe. And on the audio, you double bang. But you also go and leave that five-star review. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. So yeah.